I want us to uh, turn our minds back to the last chapter in the uh, story as far as the Old Testament is concerned, and that is our chapter today, chapter 21, Rebuilding the Walls. Now, I know, depending on where you're sitting, you may not be able to see this very well, but uh, this is a rock, right? Everybody see this? Nothing extraordinary about it, right? And uh, I've shared with you some, uh, or shared with some of you, uh, that Kristen and I actually have a piece of the Berlin Wall that her grandmother brought over uh, and gave to us. And uh, Kristen's grandmother was in Germany and was a little girl during uh, the time of Hitler when he came into power and her family, uh, she went to live in an orphanage and, and she's got a really amazing story. Years later met Kristen's granddad and, and uh, she now lives up in York, Pennsylvania. But she brought us back a piece of the Berlin Wall. Now before you knew it was a piece of the Berlin Wall, you just saw it as a plain ordinary rock. But now it kind of takes on a new meaning. It's, it's very special. Many of us remember Ronald Reagan's famous word, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. And we remember, it was my senior year in high school, we remember the Berlin Wall coming down and freedom abounding. Well, today our story is not about a wall coming down. It's actually the, the exact opposite. It's about a wall that needed to be rebuilt. Now, we've been in the story and we've learned about the journey of God's people and we learned that after the Civil War there was the, uh, the, the tribe of Israel or the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah and, and, and so the, uh, the Israelites just continue to disobey God and the Bible we learned uh, several weeks ago, uh, the Bible says that God removed Israel from his presence. Now we're left with a small kingdom in the south named Judah and Judah was headed the same direction Israel was. And God sent prophets to warn them of their sin. And over a period of a, a, a lot, several generations and a journey that's quite amazing that we've been in, we see that Judah indeed uh, turned back to God. And from the tribe of Judah was promised the Messiah. We pick up today with a guy named Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah worked for a king. You may remember from weeks past where uh, the Babylonians captured uh, Judah, took the Jews into slavery, and the Jews were dispersed into 127 different provinces. Later, Persia conquered Babylonia, and so now it was the Persian Empire, and King Cyrus of Persia allowed the Jews to go back and rebuild the holy city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so that's what we've been in in the last several weeks, and they indeed did that. But there's a problem. The, temples be re the temple has been rebuilt. The houses have been rebuilt. But the wall has not. And you say, well, Pastor, what's the big deal about that? Well, this city was very vulnerable to attacks. It did not have uh, the wall around it to protect it from invaders. And so now Nehemiah is working for a king. He's still uh, over in the, uh, in, working in the Persian Empire. And he's working for a king with a really long, weird name uh, named King Artaxerxes. And, and so he's a cupbearer, and that's going to come into play in just a moment. But Nehemiah receives some news about Jerusalem. That's where our story picks up today. So I'm going to, to instead of doing upper story, lower story, I'm going to get right into our lower story, but I am going to draw some parallels from the upper story. Everybody with me say yes. yes. All right. I'm going to try not to sound like an auctioneer, but I know I'm on a time, so we've got to hurry. If I talk fast, will you listen fast? Amen. Okay. Truth, and it's on the screen. I hope you'll write this down. If you want to uh, soak on these notes later, maybe use this as a guide for your quiet time, that'd be great because I'm going to give you some scripture. But here's truth. Here it is. God's plan for you includes a God work in you. Okay? Listen at it again. God's plan for you includes a God work or a God-sized job in you. And I've been talking uh, for the last several weeks as we've been looking at God's plan for Judah, that just like with Judah, God had a plan for them. God also has a plan for you. And that plan for you includes a God-sized job. In other words, it includes something in your life that only God can accomplish so that only God can receive the glory. Now think about it for a minute. What makes a child, if you're a parent you can, or a grandparent, you'll, you'll know this right off the bat, what makes a child feel part of the family? What makes a child feel part of a classroom setting? Very simply, if it was very simple, when he or she gets a job, when they get some responsibility, when they're given some responsibility. So, so let's go back to the family for a minute. What makes a child feel part of the family? When they're given some responsibility, now they belong. And you know what's true for our homes is true for our church family. When you come to our church when you move from being just an observer to being part of the family, something amazing happens in your heart. You begin to take ownership. 
Maybe you take some responsibility and you invest in a ministry and you fulfill God's calling in your life. And that, that helps you feel more of a part of the family because you dug in and, and, and rolled your sleeves up and, and invested in this ministry with us. And so God understands this principle. He put it within us that a job is actually uh, something we should look forward to. Work is not the curse. I've heard people say, well, when mankind fell, um, you know, God ushered in the curse of work. Now, depending on where you work, you may disagree with me, all right? But work is not a curse. Work is actually honorable. God commanded you and me, and even commanded Adam and Eve in the garden to do work. And, and so and that was before the fall. So work is honorable. And, and our work as we invest in our family, and our work as we invest in our church family, that's honorable work. And when we work and given, are given responsibility, we feel part of the family. Responsibility leads to self-worth. It leads to acceptance. It leads to a sense of belonging. And so this is true in your family, and this is true in God's family. So God has a plan in your life, and when God gave you his plan for your life, he also gave you some work to do. Here's what God is saying when he gave you a God-sized job. You matter. You are fully loved and accepted by God, and you belong. So as we look at the story of Nehemiah today, we're going to see that God had a plan for Nehemiah, God had a plan for his people, and God had a God-sized job that he was going to work in and through Nehemiah so that God could get the glory. So if you have a copy of God's Word, uh, I want to invite you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. Book of Nehemiah, and I am going to um, read through some different verses today. I'll be referring to it, and then I'm going to put some points up on the screen. And so as we look at Nehemiah today, and we're in your lower story, we're going to borrow from the upper story and draw some parallels. Here's what I hope you'll see. Number one, a God-sized job begins with a burden. A God-sized job begins with a burden. In Nehemiah chapter 1, here's what we read. I'm reading the first four verses. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So here Nehemiah is referencing things that you and I have been in over the last several weeks. And they said to me, those who survived the exile, talking about the Babylonian exile, and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now I want you to look at Nehemiah's response. He gets this devastating news that the holy city lay in ruins. And even though the temple has been, been rebuilt, and even though the city is putting itself back together and God's people are hard at work, the, the city walls lay in ruins. And Nehemiah understood the significance of that. He understood that his beloved home city, his beloved uh, center of their religious activity was still vulnerable to the enemy. And instead of Nehemiah doing what so many of us tend to do, we receive urgent news, we drop everything, we rush to the scene. I want you to look what Nehemiah did. His first response, he wept, he mourned, and then he fasted and prayed. You know, if you and I would stop long enough, even when we receive devastating news, even when we receive news that we think demands our immediate attention, if we would just learn to stop and to just think about what it is and to start processing what it is we've heard and then to pray, many times it would influence us to act differently than perhaps we do initially respond. You see, God had a God-sized job for Nehemiah. And it began with a burden. Everybody say burden. It began with a burden to do something. I'm sorry, I just got to turn this fan because I feel like I'm in a wind tunnel. There we go. I know y'all couldn't see it, but I felt like one of those models on TV with the hair blowing, even though we know that ain't going to happen, right? <laughs> it's like a Nehemiah said. I got this fan blowing on me. I know it's because Pastor West is, you know, he's old and he's hot. And I, and I, and <laughs> I did in church. because you play that $10,000 guitar all the time, see? <laughs> if you weren't here last Sunday, you don't know what that means. But anyway, we're going to move right along. When God had this God-sized job for Nehemiah, I want you to notice the burden he gave Nehemiah. 
Write this down. This is good. When you see as God sees, you will do what God does. You see, Nehemiah saw what God saw. God saw the holy city being very vulnerable. God saw walls around the holy city that lay in ruin. And God knew because these walls were ruined, because they were torn down, that his people were vulnerable. You see, when you see what God sees, you will do what God does. Instead of Nehemiah staying in the king's court, and we're going to learn in just a minute, not only was he a cupbearer, but he actually had a very prominent place in the kingdom. Not, Nehemiah didn't stay home. He didn't stay in the comfort of his home, in the comfort of his position, and say, well, you know, stinks to be them, oh well. No, he did something about it, but he didn't rush into it without praying. God gave him a burden, and he wept, and he mourned, and he prayed, and he fasted. I want to ask you, when's the last time you had a burden? When's the last time you really had a burden? When you see lost people, when's the last time you had a burden for them? When, we, when you drove to church this morning and, and you passed by your neighbors who were out in their yard mowing the grass or, or, or swimming in the pool or getting ready to go out on the boat and you know clearly they don't have a church home and you know they really don't have a, a connection to a church anywhere and you know because you've been neighbors for a while and you've observed their lifestyle, you know they're lost. Did you drive by them this morning just wave and keep going or did your heart have a burden? Did you see people as God sees them? When you pulled into our parking lot this morning, you passed by a bunch of places, a bunch of homes filled with lost people. And that's true for any church in any community. And I wonder, do we really have a burden or have we somehow developed blinders that we put on because we're so busy and we just come to church and we forget there's people all around us this isn't guilting you. It's just trying to bring back to the surface. We need to have a burden for lost people because if we don't have a burden for people who don't have Jesus, then we're not going to do anything about it. You see, when you see as God sees, you will do what God does. And when you see brokenness the way God does, you will respond the way Jesus responded. And that's what our kids were talking about this morning. Jesus healed people. He taught them about the kingdom of God and he ultimately gave his life. A God-sized job begins with a burden, but secondly, God's timing is always best. In Nehemiah chapter 2, first verse, it says this, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. Now, this may just go right over your head, so, so stop for a minute. In the month of what? Nisan. You say, well, that's a car. I drive one. But what does that mean? Well, it, here's what it means. It's a Jewish month, and it happens three months after Kislev. And so here's the deal. Three months passed by. Nehemiah stopped. He wept, he mourned, he prayed and he fasted church for how long? Three months. Three months went by. He didn't do anything except he wept and he mourned and he prayed and he fasted. And he prayed and he prayed some more. And he prayed and he fasted some more. And for three months, he communed with God. Lord, what is my response supposed to be? Sometimes you and I get in such a hurry. We dive right in. And then we pray later. We've all been guilty of that. And it's really a good motive. I mean, our intention is pure. We want to rush to the scene and, and start, uh, you know, healing whatever it is needs healing or giving our attention to whatever we need to give our attention to. Sometimes we forget to stop and just pray. Nehemiah took three months. And this is interesting in verse 2. Notice this. It says, I had not been sat in his presence before, verse 2. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. That may not mean anything to you, but here's what you need to understand. To appear before the king in a state of being downcast or sad could cost you your life. You see, when you appeared before the king, you were to put on all smiles, especially when you worked for him. Because you represented him. And if you appeared before the king being sad, that was a direct reflection of his ruling. And Nehemiah knew that. He was a cupbearer. He was not only a cupbearer who kept this king alive for 40 years, by the way. He was his protector. He was his secret service agent. He was his also, he was his advisor. And he had always played the game. He had always put on a smile. And he won favor with this king, but three months had passed. 
Three months had passed where he appeared before his king and appeared everything was okay, but inside his heart was burdened for his people and for his city. And when it was God's timing, he appeared before the king and was authentic in how he felt. Let me ask you this question. Are the risks involved in your God-sized job bigger than God himself? Are the risks involved in this God-sized job that he has for you greater than God's sovereignty? And the answer is no. So that leads me to point number three. Not only is God's timing best, but there are always risks involved when you step out to do a God-sized job. Would you agree with that? Say amen. There are always risks involved. So Nehemiah appears before the king. It's been three months. He's carried this burden. He can hide it no longer. He's now sad. And king says, Nehemiah, what's sad? You're one of my top guys. You're always in a good mood. What's going on? I know it's not because you're ill, because you were at work yesterday and you appeared to be fine. This must be sadness of the heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what is it you want? I love this. If you don't mind writing in your Bible, underline this. This is really cool. Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. You know what that says? Here's what Nehemiah was doing. Okay, God, here I go. And sometimes, maybe you've been in a conversation, sometimes I have found myself put on the spot and inside, I am praying. Amen? Lord, give me wisdom. How am I going to answer this? How am I going to respond to this? Now, all of a sudden, three months have passed. Nehemiah is being authentic and how he feels. The king says, you're downcast in your heart. What's going on? Nehemiah takes a deep breath and goes, okay, God, here we go. Well, king, and he answered him. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my fathers are buried so I can rebuild it. That's a resignation, by the way, church. Hey, king, I know I've done a really stellar job keeping you alive. And king, I don't know when's the last time you looked or, or, or checked the uh, employment office, but there's not a long line of people waiting to be your cupbearer because it's a pretty risky job. So king, I know I've done a good job. I know I'm pretty important but I need you to show favor on me as I resign and go take care of business. That's really what Nehemiah was asking. That's a pretty big request. You see, there are always risks involved when you step out to do a God-sized job. So let me ask you again. Is there any risk involved in you stepping out and doing something for God that's any greater than God's sovereignty, than His power, than His protection? No. No. In other words, God's not going to call you to do something where the risk involved make you unsuccessful. If God's called you to do something, he will call you to completion of that good work. The Apostle Paul put it this way, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in me will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Listen, friend, God's got a plan for your life. And inside of that plan is a God-sized job that only he can do through you so that he can get the glory. And when you step out and do what God's called you to do, it's not about man's success. It's about being successful in God's eyes. And what is success in God's eyes? Obedience. So there are always risks involved. But I want to encourage you this morning, don't put your focus on the risk. Put your focus on the one who called you. Church, you still with me? Say amen. Number four, you can expect opposition. I want to show you some really incredible scripture, and I'm going to move fast. Re, uh, Nehemiah, second chapter. We're going to read about a couple of guys whose name keep coming up. Second chapter, verse 10, it says this. So the king gives permission to Nehemiah. Nehemiah can now go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls. That's the good news. But there are always not only risks, but there's always opposition. Expect it. Here it is. Verse 10, when Sembalat the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. If you skip on down to verse 19, but when Sembalat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. 
are you rebelling against the king? So now they're trying to stir up dissension in the kingdom. If you skip on over to chapter 4, Nehemiah chapter 4, listen to the first six verses. And when Sembalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? If even a fox climbed upon it, he would break down their wall of stones. Guys, listen to this ridiculing just over and over and over again. And it's by the same guys. I bet you can name for me or at least write down a couple of names of people in your lifetime who just always seem to appear when you're trying to step out and do something for God and they're kind of over here barking in your ear trying to tear you down. Can you name a couple of people? I can. Can y'all say yes? See, we all have that kind of opposition. Why? Because we all have a common enemy. And Satan would love to discourage us when we step out and fulfill God's plan and do this God-sized job. And sometimes it's just people around us kind of with their arms folded, and say, you'll never do this, you can't accomplish it. We tried this before, it doesn't work. What are you doing? What are you, crazy? And that's exactly what was happening to Nehemiah and the Jews as they were rebuilding the wall. These two guys, Sembalat and Geshem, the Arab, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, they're just always kind of in the corner, just over here ridiculing, you'll never finish. Look at you, this is ridiculous. And just trying to discourage their spirit. Over in chapter 6, Nehemiah chapter 6, it says, And when word came to Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, man, these guys, they just keep coming up like a pimple, don't they? I mean, just everywhere you look throughout the story of Nehemiah, here's these three guys in the background going, nah, 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 nah. They just won't go away. And so these three guys come up again, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it. And though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sambalat, here he is again, and Geshem sent this message to me. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. That's why it's named that, by the way, because Nehemiah's like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but they were scheming to harm me. So God gave them some wisdom. God's like, hey, Nehemiah, check it out. These guys, they've been your enemy the whole time. They've been trying to discourage you when you've stepped out to do something for me. Now they're, they're, they're trying a different tactic. They're saying, hey, let's, let's meet together. Let's come together. But he knew, Nehemiah knew, they were going to scheme to do harm. And so I sent a messenger to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the answer. Then the fifth time, Sambalat sent his aide with me the same message, and in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, and he started making all kinds of false accusations about Nehemiah. Don't miss Nehemiah's answer here. Why should I stop what God has called me to do to satisfy you and your ridiculing? And yet there are some of you in here today that God has called to a great work, which indeed has involved risk, and you have gotten opposition from people in the background like these three guys. Nah, 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 you can't do it. There's no way you're ever going to accomplish it. And now you feel the need to stop what you're doing for God and go validate them and try to defend your position. Can I just help you out this morning and say, don't waste your time trying to convince the ungodly of a God-sized job in your life. Just continue to do the work. Amen? Just continue to do the work. Don't get diverted. That's what Nehemiah did. Just expect opposition. It's going to come. Why? Because we have a common enemy, and he would love to discourage us all. Jesus said it this way, don't be alarmed. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. So we can expect opposition, but finally, you can also expect God's best. Everybody say God's best. You can expect God's best. So let me read to you. After this gutsy move of Nehemiah to appear before the king and ask permission to resign so he can go rebuild the city walls, after all this incredible intimidation by these three guys and the other enemies, after all the discouragement they tried to lay in his life, Nehemiah says, I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to fall for it. I want to read you the success. Chapter 6, verse 15. And so the wall was completed. Everybody say completed. He did it. 
He did it. He did exactly what God called him to do. Nehemiah, go build the wall. Okay. It took three months of preparation. It took three months of praying and fasting. It took a gutsy move to go ask the boss if you can resign so you can go back to the city. It took a lot of intimidation from a lot of enemies. There was a lot of opposition there. But he didn't get diverted. He stayed the course. And the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and they lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. I said to you a couple of weeks ago, and let me say to you again, develop the spiritual habit of praying this, God do something so big in my life that only you can get the credit. That's exactly what happened here. Because all the odds were against Nehemiah. All the odds were against the Jews to rebuild the walls. All the odds were against him, but God says, I want you to step out and do it. And when I have a plan for you and give you a God-sized job, I will also empower you and I will protect you and I will get the glory in the end. Why did God allow Nehemiah and the Jews to continue and finish building the wall? So that God could get the glory. Why does God want to finish the plan in you? Why will he empower his plan, this God-sized job in you? Why will he empower you? Why will he protect you? Here's why. Because in the end, when all is complete and you have finished the work, you can give glory to God. Amen? That's God's desire. I want to ask the worship team, Pastor Wes, if you make your way up. Let me move us into a time of response. As you think about the upper story today, what does this mean for you in your lower story? I've said to you, God has a plan for you and, and God has a God-sized job for you. But I want to ask you a more important question. Just like the wall today in the upper story of the wall surrounding Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. What was once strong and provided protection. Listen, don't miss this. What walls in your life need to be rebuilt? What was once strong in your life that you would be honest and say, you know what, it's decaying and it needs to be rebuilt? Maybe it's your relationship with Jesus. It's not that Jesus has gone anywhere. It's just that you haven't nourished that relationship. You've not fed it what it needs, time with him and, and time in his word and, and, and serving him. So what is it in your life that was once strong that you would be honest and say, you know what, it's kind of torn down. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe you're taking one another for granted. You've not communicated like you used to. You've not shared expressions of love like you used to. And the walls around your marriage are kind of decaying and tearing down. And you would be honest today to say, you know what? We need God to do a God-sized work in our marriage and rebuild our walls. Maybe it's a relationship with your family. And some of you may be saying, Pastor, why do you always take it to the family during the time of response? Here's why. Because I've counseled a lot of families and our families are under attack from every direction. I pray you have a good relationship with your spouse and a good relationship with your children. And, and those of you that have grandchildren, I pray it's a great relationship. I'll celebrate that with you. But the stark reality is there are some of you struggling in your family relationships. And you would be honest this morning and say, you know, the walls around my family are tearing down. We were once strong. We once worshiped together and served together and ate together and, and communicated. And we're happy. And something's happened over the last several years in our home. There's just no happiness. Oh, we need God to come in and do a God-sized work in our family and rebuild what was once strong. Maybe it's just your health. Maybe you've not been taking care of yourself the way you need to. You were once strong and God says, I want to help you even in that. Maybe it's your relationship with others. Maybe it's just your job. Maybe you're just tired. You're just fatigued. You just want to give up. And doing nothing seems more appealing to you than accomplishing something that day. What was once strong and gave you purpose and got you out of bed, it's kind of weak now. It's just kind of decaying. And you need God to come in this morning and rebuild what was once strong in your life. I don't know what it is for you, but God does. So here's the response. It's very simple this morning. I'm going to ask every head to bow, every eye to close. Not because that's the only way God can hear us. I just want you to get along with God for a minute. I want you to have the spiritual courage to ask this. Lord, search me right now. Lord, would you just speak to me through your Holy Spirit? What is it? Would you reveal it to me? What is it right now in my life 
that I've ignored long enough. And if I'm honest, it's decaying and I need you to rebuild it. Maybe it's just your personal faith. Maybe that's, as, maybe that's it. Maybe today you just need to say, Lord, my faith is weak. It was once strong, but today I need you to rebuild my faith. You see, friend, I love you and I love you because Jesus loves you and he commanded me to love you and we're commanded to love one another and love compels me to say to you, you don't have to walk out of here today with those same decayed areas in your life. You can actually walk out of here today with hope that God will fulfill his plan in your life and give you wisdom to start rebuilding those walls. Walls around your faith, walls around your marriage, walls around your family, walls around your job, walls around your health, walls around your ministry. God will do that for you. Why? Because he did it for Nehemiah. And what he does for one, he'll do for all if we let him. So the response is very simple today. God, search me. Reveal to me what needs a God-sized work in my life. And once God does that, will you just be willing to confess that and then ask his strength and then ask God to give you wisdom what does it mean for you what does that mean for you is it a conversation you need to go have is it a letter or an email you need to send is it something you need to do or establish new in your life this week God will give you that wisdom ask him ask him you just have to have the faith to do it and you got to surrender to self and step out and do what God wants you to do the response is going to be different this morning. We're going to celebrate through baptism in just a moment. I want to pray for you. And then I'm just going to ask, I'm not going to ask for any movement. We're going to have a different kind of response. Here's the response. I feel like God wants to get hold of some of your hearts. I feel like there's some people here today, you've never initiated a relationship with Jesus. And today could be your day. Your walls around your life are falling apart. As a matter of fact, your life is falling apart because you don't have Christ. Would you be willing to open up your heart to the love of God today? Here's what that looks like. Lord, I know I've sinned. Our kids sang about it a while ago. Lord, I know I've sinned. I've messed up. And I believe Jesus died for my sin. I confess that today. Would you come into my life? Forgive me. And begin to heal me of the scars that sin has left. And give me a new purpose today. If that is your heart's desire, there's a blue card in the pew in front of you. I'm going to ask you to just take that out and just write me a note. Pastor, I, I, I prayed to start a relationship with Jesus today. Give me your name and a, and a way I can reach you. For those of you that have a relationship with Christ, here's the response today. Would you just be willing to sit here in the quietness of the moments while I prepare for baptism and just get along with God Confess what you need to confess. Ask for what you need to ask for. And then when we leave here today, go do what he says to do. You see, when you see as God sees, you'll do as God does. And all God's people said, Lord, your word's been preached.